Good afternoon and welcome to the Lunch and Learn webinar focused on Recreate Responsibly and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, so I, uh, my name is Jeremiah Walters and I'm the naturalist at the St. Croix River Association. Yeah, and I'm Kate Wright. Um, I focus on donor engagement and events for the St. Croix River Association as well. Uh, the St. Croix River Association is the official nonprofit partner of the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway, which is a unit of our National Park Service. SCRA is dedicated to protecting, restoring, and celebrating the St. Croix River and its watershed. As a nonprofit organization, we depend on the support of individuals and businesses throughout the watershed to carry out our vital mission. If you're inspired by our work today, please consider becoming a member or volunteering or participating at one of our upcoming events, sharing SCRA with your friends and family. Uh, for those of you who are already members, which I see a bunch of you online today, uh, thank you so much for your generous support. Yes, thank you. And uh, before we begin, we'd like to take a few moments just to talk about the Zoom software. So as I'm sure you've been in plenty of webinars this past year, um, please leave your camera off and remain on mute for this entire webinar. You can type your questions in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. We'll be sure to answer those questions after the presentation. Feel free to, to type them out throughout the webinar though. Um, this is recorded and a link will be sent out in the next few days. Uh, it will be uh, available to view on the St. Croix River Association's YouTube channel. Uh, as we move into questions towards the end of the presentation, we will put a survey in the chat box. Please take the three minutes to fill it out and uh, this will help us determine the future lunch and learn topics and let us know how we are doing. Great, so as you all know, today's topic is recreate responsibly and, and we're here to learn how to be outdoor ambassadors, right? So our presenter today is Eugenie Bostrom, the campaign and coalition manager for recreate responsibly. So I hope you all please join me in welcoming Eugenie. And then uh, Eugenie, I'm going to, um, turn the hosting over to you so that you can share your screen. Great. Um, well, just a moment. Well, while you're doing that, I'll just kind of um, give a little background um, into myself and kind of the coalition overall. And first, I want to thank you so much for hosting this conversation. It's a really important conversation, obviously, um, how we can be ambassadors for the outdoors. Um, I'll get into Recreate Responsibly, kind of the, the nitty gritty of how it began, but really I'll say um, it, it's before we become, before we can become ambassadors for the outdoors, um, people need to start just understanding their inherent relationship to the land, right? And um, whether that land is a garden outside your, you know, garden in your neighborhood, or that land is Yellowstone National Park, it's, um, we all have an inherent relationship and we all impact the land and are impacted by it, right? And so Recreate Responsibly really starts there at the apex of kind of where that relationship starts to, to build on, right? And then hopefully evolves people People through being ambassadors of the outdoors and, and I have a feeling simply by being on this call um, you already are, are pretty far along in your relationship with the land um, and so yeah I'm, I'm really excited to jump into that I will say again thank you so much for hosting I, I know a lot of folks here are from um, the Midwest we're seeing uh, I am originally from well I grew up Chicagoland area um, and have spent much time exploring Minnesota and uh, Wisconsin. And yeah, um, so really excited to kind of share the Recreate Responsibly gospel there as well. So thank you for having me. Um, I will go ahead and um, share my screen so that folks can, uh, I'll, I'll just walk us through a brief slide and then I hope that this can be more of a discussion um, on what, you know, question and answer on, you know, as far as recreate responsibly, the coalition, where we've been, where we're going, and kind of, again, yeah, how, how, how the recreate responsibly coalition can support you or your organization in kind of serving your ambassadors, if you will. Nope, not, not what I'm meaning to do. Done. I want to do present. Can everyone see my screen? Kate or Jeremiah, can you give me a thumbs up? Looks good to me. Great, thank you. Um, 
So recreate, the Recreate Responsibly Coalition campaign um, really started at the at the beginning of COVID. Um, and it started as a response to the influx of people going outdoors, um, not necessarily new users to the outdoors, but a lot in the early COVID when national parks were shut down, state parks were shut down, you know, the first couple of weeks, you had a lot of people um, who were experienced outdoorists, if you will, uh, just saying, I'm not going to be cooped up, I'm going to go outside. And they were, in essence, breaking in a lot of times to um, shut national parks, uh, forests or state state parks and lands. And so um, the, the impetus behind Recreate Responsibly really was to uh, help put out messaging to those traditional or historic outdoor recreationalists um, but quickly, within the first month of outdoor um, of Recreate Responsibly's coalition and campaign existence, it shifted towards speaking to anyone and everyone going outside. Because as soon as national parks opened, um, as soon as those those gates opened, people flooded the outdoors, and we realized that this this uh, kind of messaging and convening um that we're creating with this coalition and campaign uh, goes far beyond COVID, um, and so. Within the first few months, we established a steering committee uh, to help steer the, the direction of the campaign. And they actually devised this mission uh, for the coalition, the campaign. And, and, and really, you know, I, I, I can read it out loud for the folks. So um, the Recreate Responsibly, you know, have both coalition and campaign really aspires for everyone to have a holistic outdoor experience by advancing all aspects of responsible recreation. And the important parts of that are certainly keeping yourself, others, and outdoor places safe, accessing outdoor benefits essential to the human experience, and building an outdoors for all through justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So what that means, so that if that's our vision, what that means that we do is we really convene and connect a diverse network that is invested in advancing campaigns and resources focused on safe, accessible, inclusive, and responsible outdoor recreation. Um, I've already kind of gone born out of the global pandemic. Um, as I mentioned, you know, it was born out of this pandemic and we felt the need to respond quickly. Um, you know, our, our values mean that that we lean on responsiveness and flexibility and agility so that we can provide capacity and support. Because as I mentioned, when all of those um, uh, parks kind of reopened to the general public and they were flooded, you know, not even across the country, but certainly across the world, even um, you had land managers saying we don't we can't talk to people fast enough. <laughs> and so we, we serve to kind of create capacity in that way. And again, certainly convene and collaborate um, policymakers, industry leaders, folks like that to ensure consistent messaging um, and ensure transparent messaging as well. And and really then to take uh, our membership best practices and share that back out and amplify it. So Recreate Responsibly isn't this new organization that is trying to do something new and snazzy. It's it's a it's a convening of a lot of folks who are tried and true and folks that are newly interested in the outdoors to try to again um, create resources for for those ambassadors, right? And so, um, you know, these next slides will kind of take us into the success and the shape of the campaign, if you will. So in, in 20, we saw the success in kind of that shape that we were doing in that, um, you know, within just in 2020 alone, we saw 4 billion social impre impressions in only eight months. And to put that into perspective, we have a, um, a social media influencer uh, and who, who is our strategist as well, uh, volunteers her time. And she says, you know, she's been a quote unquote influencer for five years or so now. And she has never seen, seen an M turn to a B in terms of like from million to billion. And so um, we just saw, you know, just in terms of impressions that, that people really care about this issue. So again, it's not, it's not about how do we create ambassadors, but how do we harness people's relationship with the land that they are being ambassadors. People care about the land and they care about their relationship with it. With that, we saw 12,740 tool, toolkit downloads. Little plug, um, uh, you know, I'll have this up aside, but if you navigate yourself to recreateresponsibly.org, you can download any and all of our social media toolkits. Um, there's a lot of fun little, even Zoom backgrounds in there and stuff. So 
um, what we, you know, a website that we threw up in early COVID, just kind of threw it up real quick to get this message out, had over, you know, 118 page views and was included in the Library of Congress's historic collection of internet materials. So we were pretty excited to see that. Um, and then, you know, people were picking it up in the news. We saw 3,118 times in the news with 151 million media impressions. Oh. Um, here's just an example of our, um, of the kind of the, the toolkit materials that you can access. Um, the, the toolkit was translated in over nine different languages and we're all, always looking to continue to translate that so that it can provide more access. And, and now those really kind of the, the campaign in terms of numbers, but as far as the coalition goes, um, we saw, you know, nearly 12,000 member organizations joined. Um, we actually, most of our, our membership is uh, organizationally based and not necessarily individuals. We do have some individuals, but, um, uh, you know, if we have a thousand organizational members, we have 200 individual members. And so, um, yeah, it's really made up of, you know, organizations like the National Park Service, um, brands, small brands, um, and small and, and nonprofits across the world. Um, uh, in 2020, we saw seven state charters pop up and we have four, I think five now, uh, queued up to launch in 2020. And I'm really excited to dive into that conversation here with, um, uh, I know Jeremiah and Kate have already spoken with uh, Michigan that did lead, it has been one of the first state charters to be developed and we may be morphing that into a regional charter, which I'm really excited to see. And one thing that we've seen that's really been exciting um, for like in terms of supporting the coalition on top of the campaign is that we, we've seen attendance to our virtual convenings and in the engagement via social media or, um, or just an email is it, typically at three times the average rate of attendance and engagement. So again, just further proof that this is not something you have to try hard to get people to care about. <laughs> you just get to help help them, support them in their caring, in their ambassadorship. Um, and then this last page, which I will leave up or share again, or ask Kate and Jeremiah to share, um, is just ways that you can engage with the Recreate Responsibly Coalition. Um, again, as I mentioned, we have, uh, state and local regional charters and and so we're always um, here to help support growth uh, or kind of local activation as we call it um here i ask if, if any if folks have a campaign or collaboration idea hearkening back to originally our values of uh, agility and flexibility one of the best things about recreate responsibly is that 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 again, we responded to a global pandemic. And so we're in the business of responding to needs, right? And so for example, our next edition of the Recreate Responsibly guidance will be coming out next month and that will be our wildfire edition, right? And so, um, you know, if you have a, a local need, whether it's, you know, just simply, we have some places, um, I'm sure anyone can speak to this here. There are places all over the country and certainly the world that are just dealing with trash issues because of the increase of um, visitation outside. And so um, we're thinking of developing just recreate responsibly focused on trash and how to take care of your trash and what you can do and tips around that. So um, really anything, if you have a campaign or collaboration idea, please reach out. Um, we're always excited to expand. Um, and, and, you know, telling your story is an important part of that. Again, one of the, the pillars that we rest on is sharing best practices and certainly stories of um, success and kind of connections to the land is important to that. Um, and then that last piece uh, about the active face mask, uh, I, I will say w one of the exciting things about Recreate Responsibly is the connection between business, government, I'm gonna stop sharing now. Um, but we'll reshare that. And I'll just say it's that it's that trifecta of business, government in um, and then kind of like influential voices. Right. Um, whether that be and I would kind of put nonprofit into that pseudo governmental a lot of times, depending on, on where that nonprofit sits. But that business angle has been really critical um, to support the sustainability of the coalition in that. Businesses have noticed, oh, especially outdoor businesses have noticed, wow, um, this influx of people visiting outside is harming the land, but it might be good for my business if I'm an outdoor brand like REI. Therefore, they've 
um, by utilizing the messaging, they're trying to kind of, uh, though, though business has been good for them, negate the negative impacts on the land or potential, potential negative impacts on the land and um, kind of utilizing their brand influence to help support the coalition and the messaging and the campaign, right? And so REI, for example, which you can click and see um, within that example I showed in the slide, and again, I'll send this out afterwards, um, created an active face mask in which when people purchase it, there's not only information about the Recreate Responsibly Coalition and guidance, but then 10% of the proceeds go to support the sustainability of the coalition. And um, I think most folks on this call are nonprofit based or at least loosely affiliated with nonprofits and so can speak to the importance of um, trying to create a sustainable model so that you can continue to do mission driven work. And so really we are looking at more of these like kind of cause marketing partnerships so that we can create um, um, collaboratively create. We're not looking to just get handouts to support the coalition when we have businesses on board, they can again create products that have uh, dual missions right like pr products for good and so that's really um, where we're leaning on um, supporting sustainability of the coalition that both gets the message out and supports the work of convening continued convening um, that's kind of that as far as the the kind of brief overview of recreate responsibly i'd love to um, get questions engage um, engage folks and kind of i don't know if kate and jeremiah if you had Questions already set up. Yeah, so we're going to be taking some questions from the chat box. So if anyone wants to start dropping in questions, but I think it, it would be nice to go through uh, maybe some of the principles and and talk um, as a group about like ways that we we can get involved and and implement recreate responsibly into like our own daily um, activities outside. Yeah, well, so it, so that's that's actually a really kind of good way to frame this um, in that we've been having a lot of discussions of who's our audience, right? Who And I think, again, anyone who's worked within um, any organization that needs to speak to an external public can understand that question can be a tricky one. But really, in terms of, of the Recreate Responsibly Coalition, our audience is our coalition members. And since our coalition members are organizations, um, we're not speaking to individual ambassadors. We're speaking to organizations that will be ambassadors to the outdoors. And so by sharing, thank you for bringing this up, um, Kate, by sharing this toolkit, for example, that has really simple, easily accessible messages to a local nonprofit, we hope that then that nonprofit has an easy tool to then share that out to their public, right? Um, I, I, this is what I, I keep saying in our in our coalition steering committee meetings is, um, I think folks oftentimes get bogged down in what the end user might see, and and I'm reminding them that the end user, we cannot talk to the general public as a coalition because we don't have an an ad in in outside magazine and we don't have a, you know, a billboard in Times Square. So we are not talking to individual users going outside. We are sharing resources for our nonprofit brand managers and agency partners to share with the public prior to arrival um, in the planning process of going outside. And so again, all of this is kind of morphing and taking shape as we're seeing relevant um, issues arise in the outdoors. And so these, as you can see on the screen, these uh, principles were developed again, early COVID. Right now, um, you know, in working with our federal land management partners and state, um, state parks kind of partners, these kind of principles are still true to form coming into the summer. Um, we're, we're shifting the physical distancing a little bit um, to be less focused on on uh you know six feet because of covid but more importantly in that as we have more people going outside we need to be respectful of space um for individuals sanity and individuals uh experience in the outdoors but also because too many people on the land is in, it has a negative impact on the land and so when you're on a trail spacing out and the importance of why that's you know why we space out on trails for both you know giving other visitors respect but also um, um, 
Also incorporating wildlife, giving wildlife respect um, and distance as well. And so though the principles, the kind of the top line principles are staying the same and we will be continuing to show that out, we're shifting um, away from COVID mandates and into respectful, enduring practices in the outdoors. Um, and so as it stands now, like again, uh, for your ambassadors that you are kind of helping to shape and provide resources for, uh, um, how this can be a benefit to you is again, downloading the toolkits, um, staying abreast of the campaigns. And, and one thing that we've seen that's been so successful is consistent messaging. So when, you know, your organization is sharing the same Instagram post, Facebook post and newsletter email about, hey, this month we're focusing on how you can know before you go, how you can plan and check the status of a place and, and really understand even the, the historic use of a place. And you can share those resources. Again, all of these that you're seeing are top line. Within the toolkits, there's a wealth of messaging and supportive kind of commentary within each of those. Um, and so giving people that, like if everyone in the state of Minnesota is sharing that out at the same time, then the, it becomes this cultural milieu. And that's what we're trying to create. We're trying to create this cultural kind of general understanding and milieu of understanding that the outdoors isn't a concierge or hospitality type environment. It's actually our shared responsibility. And so, um, yeah, just trying to create conversation and high level messaging around that. And, and it's really up to our, our members to drive that. Yeah, and, and these resources are so great and so easy, which we will send out in our follow-up to everyone. Um, but you know, even if everyone in this group isn't super active on social media, you can still use these tools to have conversations with your kids and your family and your friends and spread the word that way too. Um, I want to get to, I see some questions in the chat coming in. Yep. And, and, um, oh, great. Ahead. I'm glad you can see that. And um, I think Jeremiah and I are going to read some of those too. Oh, great. Okay, cool. cool. So I'll let uh, Jeremiah start reading those. Yes. So towards the beginning, uh, when you were talking about what re Recreate Responsibly was born from, uh, Michael Goodman mm -hmm. had a question. Uh, what about the problem of things being reopened too quickly last summer? which resulted in your disaster. I think that kind of got answered throughout. Um, but yes, that was a question that was asked. Um, do you want to touch on that at all, Eugenie? Yeah, I would like to touch on that because I, I think that, that that was where, honestly, we saw Recreate Responsibly engagement um, a skyrocket because, um, so a little background myself, I worked for the National Park Service and then Department of Interior for a total of 15 years or so. So I'm very familiar with the pressures of the land management agencies. And so the certainly the the land manager land managers were being pressured to open and and in some cases did open too soon and in other cases it was right on time. And so within that, they they were not prepared for the influx, as I mentioned. And so that's where we saw this important need for consistent shared messaging to the new and old user on behalf of the land managers, whether they're state, local, or what have you, because they're busy trying to take out the trash, quite literally, or respond to um, search and rescue, or things like that. Kind of, And so messaging out to people who may come, um, we took that on. As a coalition, we took that on. And so we, that's where we saw this the skyrocketing is really the the um, opening quickly last summer, um, and so I will say just from you know having regular meetings with with um, with a lot of the land managers, uh, state, local, and federal, um, there's a lot of preparation going into what is anticipated to be a, a, an even higher um, visitation rate this summer. Great. Thank you. Um, and next question from Claire from Mermaid Echo, which works to engage children in conservation. What initiatives or opportunities do you have that I can get involved with to help kids, kids become outdoor ambassadors slash responsible recreators? Well, this is really exciting. This is the thing I'm actually really, um, I think, most excited about. Uh, 
you know, as we've been over a year now, a coalition, and we're starting to kind of retroactively get legs under us, um, we're, we're able to plan out, as I said, different kind of versions of the um, guidance and coalition rather than just continuing to share the things, how can we dial down? And so really speaking to, to kids is, is that next step or providing resources for our members to um, who engage young people. And so one of um, uh, one of our strategic partners uh, um, moving forward will be the National Park Trust, which um, if you're familiar, they don't just work on national parks. They actually just kind of that's one of their historic use. They actually um, have great campaigns that that help young people engage young people um, at every kind of uh, state parks, local parks and everything. Um, but they are, they have this really cool kind of parks pass that again, isn't just national parks, but it's all, it's this parks pass. It's a virtual parks pass. And so they're creating a recreate responsibly badge. And so, um, uh, but that's all in the process of development. So Claire, if that's something that you'd like to learn more about and know, and actually having like kind of someone on the ground, um, provide perspective onto how that would be best utilized or what other things, um, please reach out. I, I'll, I, my info will be shared at the end again, I hope in any notes, but um, you can also just email the, the website directly and um, we have staff that is really great and we'll get back to you on that. Um, but things like, uh, you know, a parks passport badge, we're also working with the Girl Scouts of America to do a similar badge and things like that just kind of um, you know, a lot of parks have junior ranger coloring books and things like that. We also, uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Every Kid in a Park pass as well that goes to fourth graders. And so we are working with the National Park Service and well, Department of the Interior rather to weave, um, weave kind of some recreate responsibly messaging, top line messaging into that um, parks pass that fourth graders get. Well, that sounds pretty awesome. Thank you for that. Um, the next question we have is from Bethany Cox. What is one creative way a nonprofit has shared one or all of these pieces of recreate responsibly that sticks in your mind? Um, well, um, I have some really creative ways that I, I would, I'd like to share more than nonprofits because we've had some super exciting ways that people have done this, both brands, agencies, and nonprofits. So I will talk about nonprofits and that we have some really cool nonprofits that um, have literally taken and woven recreate responsibly into their mission, whether that's, let me see if I can find um, this website. Uh, but you know, there, there's a, I think it's the New York Outdoor Coalition. Um, and the New York Outdoor Coalition, basically, if you navigate to their website, they have just a whole section on recreate responsibly. Um, and it, it, it sounds like really low hanging fruit for people to just continue to share the messaging. Um, and it almost sounds a little too good to be true because people always think they have to work hard to do something productive. Um, but sometimes it is the easiest thing and really just incorporating the rec incorporating the term, even if all you did was put recreate responsibly three times on your website, that would be something that would, could change the ethos and really start to shift um, the way your audience starts to think about their relationship with the outdoors, right? And so we've seen creative um, use of, of the guidance on websites and in social media, a lot of, um, a lot of nonprofits have taken our toolkits and guidance, and actually, we are coming out with um, in this next iteration of toolkits. We're we're creating more modifiable tools. So basically, like an Instagram background, a Twitter background, uh, or or like a, a newsletter template that you can use an email that incorporates the messaging without you having to do too much work. That you can just. Um, you know, take this tool and then format it to with your branding or what have you. And so no, again, our nonprofit partners, which is most of our membership our nonprofit members, we're, we're hoping to create resources so that you don't have to be creative. We're trying to be creative so that you can continue to do the good work. But for our brand partners, that's when we're like, get creative guys. And so um, there's a really cool brand called Island Tribe that is the first kind of non-traditional outdoor brands to join the coalition and they they do like high-end wedding dresses boho wedding dresses 
but they they have sustainability in their mission and they got really excited about the coalition and joined. And so they actually have, um, speaking of creative resources, they have this um, um, channel, there's this channel, a new channel, it's a social media um, site called Talk Shop Live that's basically like QVC on your phone for folks who remember QVC. And a brand will, you know, purchase a spot on, on this channel, on this streaming channel, and then they'll basically have a show where they talk about their products. This brand, Island Tribe, used an entire hour to talk about recreate responsibly. Rather than sell their products, they were really selling, selling the concept of, rec of sustainable, conscious consumerism and responsible recreation within that. So we're, again, leaning on our, our brand partners who have more capacity to get creative with the sharing. And we're hoping that our, our nonprofit partners um, will share in whatever way they have capacity for. And if they, I mean, some of our larger nonprofit partners, uh, National Park Foundation, for example, right before I came onto this, they hosted a Twitter Spaces conversation on Recreate Responsibly. Twitter Spaces is basically Clubhouse. Um, if folks are familiar with that. So it was this opportunity to have kind of audio uh, audio conversation on Twitter, specifically dialing down to the Recreate Responsibly principles. And so we do have our larger nonprofit partners that are, are coming up with creative ways of, of doing things like that. Um, the National Park Foundation also created all these um, cool posters for Recreate Responsibly. You may have seen them. They're kind of harkening back to the, um, the WPA posters and uh you know they're 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 showing you how far it is between six feet between one another by sh having a bear or an elk or something it's some pretty pretty cool stuff so there are ways to get creative for sure awesome yes those ones that you listed out towards the end were, are very I, i've seen those and they're a lot of fun to look at like how many salmon does it take to be at six yeah. feet apart? it's really fun um yeah i love uh, those yes our next question comes from sophia patain uh, how were the original principles of Recreate Responsibly chosen and developed? Who was part of that initial conversation? Ah, so the first two organizations that came together and said, hey, we should say something because people are breaking into parks <laughs> and, um, and it's unsafe. Uh, it was the Outdoor Alliance and REI and REI Foundation. From that, those two who have a wealth of kind of partners in the outdoor industry invited other interested parties, the North Face National Park Service, National Park Foundation, um, the US Forest Service, uh, uh, rec.gov, if any of you have been to recreation.gov to book yourself a site, you're familiar with that. That represents all campsites and kind of permitting processes throughout the federal land management agencies and even some states. Um, and so uh, those were kind of those were the heavy hitters early on. I think the first you know, two brands were North Face and then some larger nonprofit partners like Outdoor Afro. Um, again, Outdoor Alliance uh, is a is a was the found one of the founding partners, and um, the 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 record the ch principles were chosen through a series of come of, of meetings and convenings. I think it was um, they met once a week. So I came on FYI a, a month after the coalition was formed, and so I wasn't a part of those first kind of decisions of the the principles. But I do believe that those uh, parties that I mentioned met once a week and just kind of said you know, how can we build on, how do we build on leave no trace ethics, which as you'll, as I'm sure you're familiar with, which we can show again, leave no trace is one of the principles. How do we build on these leave no trace ethics to include kind of pre-visitation concepts and, and just kind of like early on concepts. How do we introduce people at a very accessible level to um, concepts of leave no trace and two concepts of kind of shared responsibility and environment. Again, if this is all about like our relationship with the outdoors, it was, it was just about like kind of throwing things on the board and seeing what stuck in those initial meetings. And, and that's kind of what happened. I think people threw that out. They saw what resonated and just kind of boiled it down to these are the points that resonate with people and that, that we think then speak to, um, a healthy and, um, a healthy relationship with the outdoors. Great, awesome. Yes, those are those sounded like fun conversations to be part of back then. 
It feels more than a year ago, but uh, I know, yeah. <laughs> great. Our next question uh, from Amy Short. Can you talk about the river focus program tools and experiences where many entry points and types of users uh, from kayaks to weekend party boats and also suggestions for how member organizations have reached to those who may not be part of the usual points of communication about responsible land and water use? So I see two very distinct questions in there. I'm going to answer the river or um, uh, just water focused one at that. So again, just in the same way we're creating a wildfire edition of the guidance. Um, we have been working concurrently with um, NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration's National Marine Sanctuaries Division. So um, obviously focused on water. Also the Army Corps of Engineers manages a lot of our waterways um, and water recreation sites as well. Um, so taking those two, kind of two federal entities and then pairing them with um, organizations like American Rivers and American Whitewater um, at the national level to, again, they all have their best practices, right? But how can we kind of create cohesive, think cohesive messaging throughout those best practices and share collectively so we're taking those top line messages from each of those kind of entities sharing top line messaging and we will have a river and water focused uh guidelines coming out in the next few months i hope it's certainly in anticipation for summer um and so that's one thing and amy if you sound passionate about boats and water and kind of act those access points so please do reach out we'd love to get you involved in that um, working group. So we have many ad hoc working groups happening uh, all the time on these kind of like more focused uh, populaces. And so yes, please do reach out for that if you have expertise and you'd like to share. Um, and then how member organizations have reached those who may not be a part of usual points of communications about responsible land and water use. Honestly, I, I think that's where we've just leaned into the power of social media with 5 billion impressions. Um, I have to assume actually most of those are non traditional users and non like didn't come to us necessarily through or didn't get that impression through. Um, you know, a, a, a meetup or certainly no one is meeting up or through, you know, a, a newsletter, I have to assume that 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 was reaching people of those 5 billion impressions. Um, who may not be a part of the usual points of communications and so. It is hard to break out of any bubble that you're in communications wise, even though social media is supposed to be enabling us to connect more, connect more. In many ways, it does silo us um, because the algorithm of social media only shows you what it thinks you want to see. Correct. However, that's one of the uh, like kind of values of Recreate Responsibly Coalition is to um, bring in non traditional voices into this space again. So having brands like Island Tribe, or I will say one of our uh, most successful partnerships last summer was with Bud Light Seltzer. Bud Light Seltzer uh, came to the Recreate Responsibly Coalition and just said, can we use your messaging for a part of this campaign we want to do? And Bud Light Seltzer sent out um, ambassadors, talking about ambassadors, Bud Light Seltzer hired, I think four ambassadors, sent them out in Bud Light Seltzer vans to trailheads across the Pacific Northwest. On their vans, it just said hashtag recreate responsibly, recreate responsibly.org, and obviously Bud Light Seltzer. They would park at these trailheads and then they'd clean up trailheads. That was all they, they weren't passing out alcoholic beverages. That would have been illegal. They weren't even, they, they weren't even passing out, you know, they were simply cleaning up the trailhead and had Bud Light Seltzer hats on. And but all of those ambassadors were versed in the principles in Lake Leave No Trace. And so um, that was a really creative example of how we saw kind of building an ambassadorship program that both benefited, obviously benefited the brand itself, because they said the ambassadors reported back that they had never seen such positive feedback from people that they were engaging with on the trails. People kept saying, oh, my gosh, I didn't know Bud Light cared about anything. And they said, oh, well, actually we care about people cleaning up after themselves at trailheads because a lot of people like to drink a beer or a hard seltzer after, after um, a long hike. And so making that connection. Um, so again, partnering with folks like Bud Light Seltzer is a, not a usual point of communication about responsible land and water use, 
but it was by by and far the most successful. Well, I think that. Oh, oh, go ahead, Kate. Yep. I was gonna say I think that that's a really important point for everyone in this room right now too is is never to count anyone out or assume that they don't want to be involved in in taking care of our public green spaces. So um, the the Bud Light Seltzer, what a great example. It totally is. Yeah. Um, another question from Claire, uh, as a brand and social media influencer, how can I join the coalition? Is there an application or credentials qualifications? No, and I will say, so I'm so excited about this question because um, it kind of is in concert with um, our, our, our kind of strategist, our social media strategist, um, Katie Bouet, uh, who's who's an outdoor influencer, um, just tweeted today about how um, how it's the the out like caring for the outdoors is the least exclusive club you can ever join. If you care for the outdoors, you care for the outdoors. There's no qualification necessary to care for the outdoors. And so um, we only ask that you start caring and start sharing that you're caring, right? That's part of the coalition. And so certainly we're, we're sticking to that um, within Recreate Responsibly. I will say we are starting to build out a membership structure and what membership look, looks like because I think, uh, Claire, to your question, it is, it's a little strange just be like, how do I join it? Just sign up. That seems a little fishy. Again, we're retroactively building structure around this thing that grew so fast. We didn't expect, um, we couldn't have expected it. And so, um, everyone who goes to the website today and joins, you're just a member. You get access to the toolkits, you get um, access to newsletters. And, and if you're interested in joining, like, and participating and you can contribute to actual coalition work, helping to shape the, the campaigns and such, um, then all you have to do is email and ask and we'll get you plugged in. We, that said, we are probably in the next month or two creating more of a membership structure where it will be clear on the website that you can join as an active member and that will be a slight dues or commitment to um, to work, to uh, contributing to the um, kind of uh, committee work. Because I, like I said, there's literally hundreds of committees going on, uh, committee meetings going on at the same time. And so, um, you know, we want to give space for people who have capacity to contribute their expertise like you, Claire, and your um, influencer um, kind of body body of work. And so we want to create space for people who have that capacity and also space for people who might not have the capacity to contribute to conversations because they're busy doing their job, but might have the financial resources to support that work. So creating more of an activated membership that outlines that still hopefully really entry level, like anywhere between one dollar and thousand dollars is what we're looking at for more of an activated membership that's not finalized yet um however still creating space for anyone who wants to be an ambassador what we're calling general membership is 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 basically an ambassadorship moving forward in the near, next structure access to the toolkit will remain to be free all you have to do is put in your email you'll get a toolkit and then you'll you can continue, have continued access to updates to toolkits right and so ambassadorship always free we're just calling it general membership, but it's ambassadorship. And then we, again, next level, more of an activated membership opportunity, right? So go to the website, plug in your email. We'd love to have you on board. And then um, I'll also share my personal email as well at the end of this. So if anyone wants to reach out to me directly or remind me of this conversation so we can get you plugged in sooner, please, um, I, will, I will pop that in the chat towards the end. Great, that's awesome. Thank you for that, Eugene. Um, another question uh, from Katie Stickman. More often than not, I have been seeing disposable masks on the trail at trailheads. Does Recreate Responsibly plan on addressing this or continue lumping it in with general trash cleanup? Oh, I, I love this group. I love I love questions. So I, I, I as I mentioned, I just did a, a like that Twitter chat thing and there were no questions from the group, which is so much harder because I'm like, well, what do you want to know? I love the questions from this group because you're you're asking the things that I'm excited about. So, um, one of we have a couple steering committee members um, for the national coalition that are really excited to kind of marry the idea, um, like all of these amazing artists in the outdoors and how do we utilize art? And historically, 
the outdoors and art have always been tied together, um, especially when it comes to policy. Um, I'm getting a little outdoor wonky and geeky here, but the, the national parks wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for painter Thomas Moran, right? And so like if folks don't know the history of Yellowstone National Park, um, John Muir kept coming back to Congress and saying, there's these beautiful places out here. And lots of people said, we need to protect them. We need to preserve them. Congress said, meh. And then, then they brought a painter out there to paint the landscapes and then bring it back to Congress and say, look at this. This is amazing. Let's preserve it. So art and the outdoors and policy and preservation for the outdoors have always been inextricably linked. Again, hearkening back to those WPA posters that the that the Park Service and the National Park Foundation have been putting out that people get really excited about. That said, we have some exciting ideas to collaborate with art artists um, to come up with innovative ideas to share specific messaging around this specific topic around like, look, we have all these whether it's doing uh, who knows if someone's going to do an installation art piece or create a cartoon. I have no idea. I am not a visual artist. I just appreciate it. <laughs> Um, and so we are trying to work with artists to come up with creative solutions and innovative ideas to help specifically uh, this specific mask issue. I, I totally agree. I, I've, I have seen more masks than any other like specific piece of garbage out in the outdoors and on trails. So yeah, it's definitely an issue and, and we're trying to get creative around the addressing of it. Awesome, yes, great question. <laughs> Uh, so another question or a question from Melissa Wallace, um, a lot of a lot more people have adopted pets during the pandemic and they take them hiking and camping. Some of these pet owners aren't very responsible about picking up their dog species. Is your organization doing anything to educate dog owners about how to recreate responsibly with their pets? Again, an opportunity for more nuanced things that, that we're working on. We are we. Honestly, to do this work, because it's a volunteer coalition, we would hope that we would have a leading organization like, I don't know, if Chewy.com, I, I could, if we could reach out to Chewy.com to help us spread that message, because again, most people right now within the coalition, most of our membership speaks to people who do carry bags and who do care about them. So in order to speak to that new audience, we would be, we would and to have that be successful, we hope to bring in a partner that already has the audience, right? And so a Chewy.com, a Paw.com, what have you, BarkBox, um, looking at reaching out or hopefully ha having them come to us or what have you, um, will be a more successful part of that campaign. Um, however, we are weaving in that story in the complementary messaging with within the toolkits. And so specifically within the winter edition, we actually wove that into our top line messaging to how how important it is to take care of your your pets um uh your pet waste because because of water you know water is our it's it's our water source snow is our water source and so we were we thought that that was really important during our winter messaging to weave that into the top line but i agree it's an issue all of the time um but there's so much that we need to say. We need to be careful about where we put the top line messaging and we need to be strategic about where we put that complimentary messaging. And again, hoping we can find like a, you know, a partner like a Chewy.com to speak to an audience that we don't yet have would be ideal for that messaging. And that's a great example of how all the people in this group can find their own ways to put their mark on getting engaged. So exactly. uh, this person who asked the question, like if you're really passionate about that, that's something to, you know, post on your social media and share um, you leading as an example doing that. That's a great point. Yeah. So yeah, no, I think to that point, Kate, like if um, I'm, I'm not sure who asked the question, I, Melissa, I see here, um, Melissa, if you have insight or experience or just passion for that, um, then then, yeah, I mean, again, it doesn't we don't have to have the audience. We can start saying the message even without, you know, we can remind people who are already going outdoors that this is this is a good idea. And therefore, um, yeah, I think. Uh, Melissa, please reach out. You'll you'll get my email address, and and we can um, start kind of crafting that together with our team. Awesome. Uh, so the last question that I have uh, set up from Aaron Johnson: How might employers activate this campaign as a means of employee engagement? 
Ah, that's a really, really great question. Um, we have had quite a few. It's interesting because a lot of folks do volunteer opportunities for their employee engagement, right? And historically, corporations, large and small, have done volunteer cleanups and things like that. Obviously, during COVID, you had to get innovative. Um, and so I like so Bud Light Seltzer, for example, they actually use Recreate Responsibly as a theme for their virtual convening and obviously showcased that campaign. And actually, it, was, it wasn't just Bud Light Seltzer, it was all of Anheuser-Busch used uh, Recreate Responsibly as a theme of their uh, virtual convening. Um, so there are ways to do that if you're still doing virtual convenings. Honestly, it, it, de it depends on the level of your organization and kind of the, the current access points you have to. And so we've seen um, people weave in if they, if they ha heavily use Slack within their company or organization, um, weaving in prizes. Like, honestly, we're starting to look at like how can we give out REI gift cards or things like that for employers that share um, share the messaging throughout their their company and things like that. So um, there's some creative ways to do it. I, I, I think a lot of people have been like, have not known how to engage their employees without volunteer events. Though I do think we're gonna start moving into more volunteer events again, and certainly simply hosting a cleanup um, or or I think more importantly than doing a cleanup with employer, employees, um, hosting kind of an ambassador campaign or opportunity, whether that's like posting recreate responsibly principles or guidance at trailheads, if if you're allowed to, of course, or sharing, you know, sharing it otherwise in some other creative ways, hosting a pop up where you're you're just standing there at trailheads talking to people. There's there's lots of different ways that I think um, folks can do that. But certainly, again, we've been leaning on the use of virtual technology. I mean, we all have in the last year. And so to the ways that we can kind of just share tidbits via Slack and incentivize employees to to do that is a great idea. So that is, so that is questions. questions. Um, if we have any more, please feel free to uh, either send those in the chat right now or email us, or as Eugenie mentioned, mentioned uh, she will be sharing her email. So you could uh, go right to the source with those questions. Great, thanks for popping that in the chat box, Eugenie. Yeah. Um, I've really enjoyed the, you know, it's funny. I, 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 I tend to feed off of like, the Zoom where people are talking, but I love how how um, efficiently and engaged, uh, how efficiently you manage the chat and how engaged people were on the chat. And I really appreciated these conversations. This is where we're going to be successful in having cohesive and impactful messaging for everyone is by having these conversations, and sharing this. Like we. Um, having having honestly me having the access to you so that you can tell me what's important is far more important than me coming here and sharing what we what we do and what our plan is because our plan is nothing without you guys who are on the ground actually um working with the land working with the people who are accessing the land so um i can't thank Kate and Jeremiah enough for having me here and for you guys for showing up and being here um, and asking these really great questions and I hope emailing me with ideas and joining the coalition. Yeah, no, thank you so much. I mean, I think this was like, this was meant to be more of like a webinar, but I it felt like it turned into something more constructive and uh, it felt really good to hear those questions and then hear you answer them. So thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, it's funny because I, I, it's hard to do recreate responsibly in a webinar because because our baseline is responsiveness, right? We we were we are a response to a global pandemic. Therefore, I think we'll continue to be a responsive body that serves this that wants to serve. So, um, I think I had one last. Uh, oh, I did want to say I did want to plug. Uh, since you, I don't know exactly where Kate and Jeremiah are at with conversations about a regional chapter of recreate responsibly but i think that is in the works still um and and so it, not only do i hope you you know join 
the coalition, the national coalition, but then I hope you'll stay tuned for the localized developments. We, we think it's really important, especially, um, you know, again, the summer increased use and then from here on out having having uh, relevant resources. And so being able to connect locally because of obviously the impacts of the ecosystem and the cultural relevant points is gonna be um, crucial. So please stay tuned for that. Um, and thank you again, Kate and Jeremiah for your leadership, not only here today, but in that um, effort. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Great, well, it is just about one o'clock um, I'll check the chat one more time. Uh, we gotta, we gotta thank you. So that's pretty awesome. But I'm not seeing any more questions. So, awesome. Well, I hope everyone can kind of join us in, in thanking you, Jeannie, for her time today and for the efforts of Recreate Responsibly. Um, so we've been just honored to have you on today, and um, we have been recording this. And so um, when we do send up our send out our follow up. Tomorrow we will send these resources we've been talking about and showing today, um, as well as some contact information and the website and different things so that you all will be able to um, explore all of those tools on your own. And then um, you. if you're interested in learning more about SCRA's upcoming events, including our spring gathering, um, please visit our website, which is St. Croix River Association.org, and we will also send a link to that in that follow up email. Um, but you know, you don't want to miss all of these events we have coming up. We've all been cooped up inside. And so come and get outside with us this summer and um, keep your eyes uh, posted on our website um, for all of these events that are popping up every day. All right. So thanks to everyone here who attended. Thank you. Um, look for that email from us. And again, a big special thank you to you, Eugenie. Yes, thank you so thank much. You. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. You too. Bye.